I'm Allie McKnight, and I'm here to talk to you about naming things in Elm. Uh, but first, I want to talk to you about your brain. Uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to show you a series of characters. Do your best to remember them. Uh, here are the characters. Try really hard. It matters. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Raise your hand uh, if you answer yes. Did any of you group them together to help you remember? <laughs> this worked out great. Uh, <laughs> did anyone use a mnemonic device? Nice. Um, who can remember them? <laughs> uh, <laughs> There are lots of tricks to help us remember data, uh, but why do we do this? Why don't most people just remember the series of characters outright? Uh, well, let's actually talk about your brain. And heads up, this is a total oversimplification to make a point, so please forgive me. Um, we have something called working memory. Uh, it's the part of short-term memory that is concerned with immediate conscious perceptual and linguistic processing. I don't expect you to know what that means. Um, but if your long-term memory was your hard drive, and your short-term memory was your RAM, your working memory uh, is your the CPU. Our working memory is hyper-fast. It's the stuff that we're keeping in our head for immediate use. The problem is it can't hold on to very much at one time. In fact, most people can only hold about two to nine pieces of information in their head uh, at any given moment. The bell curve for that peaks around four. This is why we use grouping, mnemonic devices, and other tricks to remember things. We're strapping together information to fit into one of these four-ish slots. But what happens when we run out of slots? We write notes. We flip between pages. We ask Joe Schmo if he knows. He doesn't. We swap out information as we need it. Or we try really, really hard to remember an extra thing. This is tiring. And if you do this all day, which, full transparency, I totally have, uh, you're, you're going to burn out. Let's look at three popular variable names, count, list, and A. Count is something we see enough times that we've built an expectation of what it means and its type, an int. When we see it in the wild, it requires zero working memory to know what it is. List also has the expectation that generally it's type list. <laughs> uh, now, if we just see list, we don't know what it's a list of, but at least we have some information. Now, this last variable, A, provides neither meaning nor type. It requires the most amount of working memory to hold on to these pieces of information because there are no expectations that can be applied. User.h, what do we already know? If it compiles, it's a record. Uh, and age, we can expect, is an int. We can safely load that information uh, into our working memory, expand these expectations from this small bite-sized piece uh, and add layers of expe expectation, it allows us to build a mental model that we can fit an entirety of a huge code base. Setting up default expectations and seeing patterns are how we're going to leverage our working memory to be able to work faster and more efficiently. And we do this with good names. Using good names in your code is important for a lot of reasons. It makes it understandable for future devs, it communicates responsibility and intention. It can make code cleaner and easier to read. But also, it makes working within the code a better experience for your working memory that doesn't burn you out. And I'm going to try to show you how. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this quote before. In fact, I know a few of you actually quoted it to me today. Um, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. My only addition to what Phil Carlton said is, yep. <laughs> yep. There's no perfect strategy for naming things in Elm. There are just strategies with more favorable trade-offs. However, that being said, what I'd like you all to take away from this, at the very least, is an appreciation for good naming in your code. If you go home and take a few extra minutes in your next code review, to think about the naming of a variable or a function or a module, I will consider that a success. When we talk about naming, there are two categories of rules. The first is naming conventions. This generally includes uh, finite rules about how things should be named. For example, 
all functions that produce HTML mes message should be prefixed with view. Um, coming from a Ruby and Python background, I think these are a great idea, but they're not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'll leave those to the greater Elm community or maybe my next conference talk. <laughs> uh, the second category revolves around what happens when those naming conventions are not applicable. They're the guiding lights we use when we need to pluck a name out of thin air that's specific to our code. This is what I'm going to be talking about today. When we talk about these guiding lights, we have to have an idea of what they're guiding us toward. What makes a name good? If the name answers yes to the following questions, we can assume it's doing its job. One, does the name keep us in the process flow? What I mean by this is that a good name ideally should never be a sticking point. As a reader of the code, a good name should allow you to keep working your way through the pertinent data without the need to look something up or jump around the lines of code to try to decipher meaning. Two, does the name help the reader build an accurate mental model of the code? A mental model is the human readable metaphor of the data flow. If the naming builds an inaccurate mental model uh, or the absence of a name leaves a gap in the mental model, there's a problem. Number three, does the reader know accurately what the thing you're naming is? This one you can more or less take at face value. Uh, if you're coming away from reading a variable thinking it's something it's not, it probably needs some improvement. Each of these criteria contribute to reducing the amount of data we need to keep in our head. Working memory when moving at a good pace should be like the ebb and flow of different information. When you're getting hung up on poor naming, it's like picking up the same burden again and again without ever having the opportunity to offload it. These burdens occur when we hit a line that doesn't fit the narrative of how a program is working in our mental model. So I know I mentioned uh, a second ago what a mental model is, but I do want to dive a little deeper as to what it is in this context. When we talk about a mental model, we're referring to how we as humans group data together. For example, the concept of type student and how it interacts with type class is a human idea. Uh, it helps us keep complex data as part of a narrative. When our code doesn't fit into this narrative, it's doing a poor job of helping us establish understandable pathways that easily slot into one of those um, working memory slots. Let's take a look at this function, add finished assignment to model. It takes an assignment, a student, and our model. Then the assignment and student get passed into assignment has start date filled in. That value is passed into questions with answers added. And then we get to pass that into model takes assignment with grade. The nuts and bolts of what these functions are doing are pretty clear. But here's the thing. I don't care. Why would we have named functions in this pipeline if we're not providing a human readable narrative? In fact, these functions are not only useless, they're also detrimental to keeping our working memory manageable. We have to know why, for an example, an assignment wants its start date filled in. What does doing that mean? We could try to make assumptions, and they may or may not be right, but no matter what, it'll slow us down. Whoops. This is what this function would look like if we try to write it in a way which sticks to a narrative. A function, complete assignment, takes the same arguments as the previous function. We start the assignment, questions are answered, and then the assignment is graded. We are adding to the story. It's almost like adding a chapter to your Choose Your Own Adventure book. <laughs> Elm types are uniquely effective in allowing us to create these narratives. We just need to make sure our naming reflects our metaphors. Something also to be aware of is even if we stick to writing narrative-focused metaphors, we have to make sure that it's the same metaphor all the way through. <laughs> Uh, for example, if our metaphor starts with type truck driver, but later on there's a function which changes a status field of type truck driver to off the rails or out to sea, that's going to be confusing for everyone. <laughs> I'm a big fan of extended metaphors, but you definitely have to be careful that the more you stretch it, the thinner it becomes. But hopefully when you're aware of this, you can keep an eye on it and add to the story uh, in a way that makes sense. As I mentioned before, a story means flow. Uh, and a flow is easier to remember than separate elements. It allows us to be more lazy, and being lazy is good. 
But one thing that falls on both sides of the laziness debate that I have in my head uh, is using anonymous functions. Uh, on one hand, they do a small job, and we don't have to jump to another function to find out how it works. On the other hand, it can often have unnamed arguments uh, that provide no context for the reasoning and intention of why we are performing a particular set of logic. Take, for example, this function graduation years. It takes a list of students and returns back a list of years. Cool. The students are then piped into an anonymous function which adds four to the start of each student. Start year, yeah. But the A in this context doesn't mean anything. Uh, we have to look at what's being piped in to know what it is. When the function is much larger and the pipeline is longer, we have to go searching around for what that argument is. Um, but the easy solution here is just to name it. All right, so now we have a named variable and it seems to make sense. But the anonymous operation still doesn't have context. What if we just named that? Great. Now we understand what the operation does without having to get into the nitty gritty of how it does it. Of course, now we have a function that just calls list.map. We don't need an entire function for that. If we go ahead and delete graduation years, we can use graduation year in line. The naming abstraction allowed us to unlock a better refactor. We now have more understandable code with fewer occasions that we need to hop around lines. In addition, our function is more flexible. In the original version, we would have to remember or assume what graduation years returned. But now that list.map is inline where our function is called, we have a much better idea without having to jump around. Now that we have a couple tools under our belts, let's take a look at a function word by word and see if there are any things that pop out at us. Uh, here's a function named filter grade five students. Just from this function name, we know we have to already keep three things in our head. What is type student? Where the grade information is being stored per student? And whether this function leaves fifth graders or takes them out? <laughs> I realize now that was a poor choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can see here, filter grade five students takes two things. A list of students, okay, that makes sense, and it also takes the model. Why? I guess the grade information isn't on the student? Uh, I'm confused. And it gives back active student. That's a fourth piece of information we suddenly need to keep in our working memory. If you fall in that lower half of that bell curve I uh, showed earlier, you have just hit your limit and we're not even in the function yet. The function itself starts by piping a list of students and mapping over the second element of the tuple. So I guess type student is a tuple. Uh, and we're just throwing away the first element, whatever that was. Then we're sending A to only fifth grader. I think it's fair to say that this anonymous function is what takes out any students who are not fifth graders, but we can't be sure. However, the function isn't done. It takes that list and then pipes it into active students. So we're left with the following questions. Are we filtering out or are we keeping fifth grade students? Type student is a tuple? What does active students have to do with filtering? And what's the first value of type student? This function leaves a gap in our mental model. It says a thing which it is not, and the process flow is interrupted a number of times. It's safe to say that this function violates every one of our guiding lights. But thankfully at this point, we already know how to fix some of these. Here we've replaced the function name with a name that represents its role that it plays in the narrative. Fifth graders in class. It tells us that it returns fifth graders who are actively in class. It makes sense now that it both filters and returns active student. We've also named the second argument of the student tuple, showing us that only fifth grader, uh, what, it, what only fifth grader takes. Uh, and it also uh, sheds a bit more light on what type student is. This function is not perfect, but it's a lot better. One thing that still bugs me, though, is that student type. It defies our expectations. Quite literally, we expect student to be a record or a custom type. But thankfully, I would say it's out of the ordinary to see types like this as tuples. However, I do think it's more common to see tuples as return values of a function. Sometimes we need a function to return more than one thing. My question is, when I see this, why a tuple? In other languages, it makes sense. Tuples are always the same size, meaning that memory allocation is easier, but this doesn't apply to Elm. Elm compiles tuples and, say, records into the same JavaScript code. 
So when we use a tuple, we have to be intentionally saying, I'm okay not having the order or content information right at my fingertips, but when is that okay? When is that okay? It's okay when that information is already in our memory, not working memory. I'm talking about when we use a tuple enough that we already know what its type signature is without looking. A great example of this is what update returns. Uh, it's a tuple with model as its first value and command message as its second value. It's, the tuple is perfect for this scenario because I don't know about you, but that combo is burned into my brain. Uh, when you do need to write a function that returns more than one value, and we know that we're not going to be seeing it more than a few times, name your values. Use a record. Records take away the onus on you to remember order or types. In fact, whenever there's an occasion for us to remember the order of arguments, use a record. Take, for example, this function. View coaching staff. It takes three strings, which represent head coach, the trainer, and the special teams coach. In this scenario, there is a high likelihood that I'm gonna mess up the order of arguments, either here or at the function call. And when this is a more chewy function than one that just displays strings, this innocent swap can end up being one heck of a hard nut to debug. But if we name these values coming in, we don't have to worry about it. Check out this coaching staff type alias. We get to name each of our values. Passing this in means we don't have to worry about the order of arguments uh, when they come in. When we call view coaching staff, we'll have to construct a type coaching staff, which means filling in labeled slots instead of remembering order. Uh, I know this is on the nose a bit, but good naming in this example leads to fewer things to hold in our head. That's, that's the theme of the talk, guys. <laughs> um, all right, so what are tools for helping us manage our working memory with naming? Add to the narrative. Naming things in a way which adds to a story helps things slot into our brain as part of a process flow. Use a good metaphor to help your code uh, become more human readable and therefore more easy to follow. Abstract away. Name your bite-sized logic and it'll add context and intention. It can unlock better refactoring and make your functions more flexible. Use tuples sparingly. Use only a tuple when we know we're gonna see it a number of times, allowing us to keep its types and contents out of our working memory. Use records. Uh, order should never be something that you have to actively hold in your head. Name your fields and you don't have to. Hopefully these tools will help you write code that's more understandable, readable, and with less memory burnout. Um, I'll be taking questions in the hall. Thank you very much. <laughs>